This is chapter two, atoms, molecules, and ions for the book Chemistry, the Central Science of Dr. Brown. By the end of this model, you'll be able to list basic postulates of Dalton's theory, atomic theory. You will describe the key experiments that led to the discovery of electrons and to the nuclear model of the atom. You'll describe the structure of the atom in terms of protons, neutrons, and electron. Also, you'll be able to describe the electrical charge and relative masses of protons, neutrons, and electrons. You will learn how to use chemical symbols together with atomic number and mass number to express the subatomic composition of isotopes. You will know how to calculate the atomic weight and of an element from the masses of individual atoms and knowledge of natural abundance. Also, you will describe how elements are organized in the periodic table by atomic number and similarities in chemical behavior, given rise to periods and groups. You will identify the locations of metals and nonmetals in the periodic table. You will be able to distinguish between molecular substances and ionic substances in terms of their composition. You will distinguish between an empirical formula and molecular formulas. Also, you will describe how molecular formulas and structural formulas are used to represent the composition of molecules. You will explain how ions are formed by gain or loss of electrons and be able to use the periodic table to predict the charges of common ions. You will learn how to write empirical formulas of ionic compounds given the charges of their component ions. Also, you will write the name of ionic compound given its chemical formula or write the chemical formula given its name. The same thing with bi binary and organic compounds and also you will be able to identify organic compounds and name simple alkanes and alcohols. So let's start with the atomic theory of matter. This one is known as the Dalton's atomic theory. The theory that atoms are the fundamental building blocks of matter emerged in the early 19th century uh, by John Dalton. He mentioned that the H element is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. So atom is basically the smallest uh, particle you can find in matter with, this, with specific characteristics. All atoms of a given element are identical to one another in mass and other properties, but the atoms of one element are different from the atoms of all other elements. So here we have, for example, the uh, representation of oxygen in the red spheres. All the atoms of oxygen, they are the same. Here we have the atoms of nitrogen represented by blue spheres. All of these atoms are the same, but the atom of oxygen is different from the atom of nitrogen. Okay, so it, when you're talking about an element, all of the atoms of that specific element, they are the same. But when you're comparing atoms from different elements, those are different. Those atoms are different. So atoms of an element are not ch changed into atoms of a different element by chemical reaction. Atoms are neither created nor destroyed in chemical reaction. So if you have a hydrogen, that atom is going to be always hydrogen. You can change that to another element. Same way with oxygen and nitrogen. Okay, you can is uh, you, you can change um, the element okay to another one by chemical reaction. And atoms of more than one element combine to form compounds. A given compound always has the same relative numbers and kind of atoms as we mentioned in, in, the, in chapter number one. Here we have, for example, nitro oxide and O, one atom of nitrogen, one atom of oxygen, producing this compound. So basically, that's a combination of atoms that create a compound. There is a law that is known as the law of conservation of mass. It says that a total mass of a substances present at the end of a chemical process is the same as the mass of substances present before the process took place. So the total ma mass of all substances at the beginning of reaction 
has to be the same at the end. Even though there are going to be maybe different kind of compounds because there was a chemical reaction. So you start with A, B, and you're going to produce C and D. Different compounds. But the mass, the total mass, has to be equal at the end as well as the beginning. This law was one of the laws on which Dalton's atomic theory was based. The law of multiple proportion. If two elements, A and B, form more than one compound, the masses of B that combine with a given mass of A are in the ratio of small whole numbers. Dalton predicted this law and observed it while developing his atomic theory. When two or more compounds exist, from the same element, they cannot have the same relative number of atoms. So we can have, for example, H2O, but also we can have H2O2. H2O is water, H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. So even though they are basically the same elements, but they, the proportion, the ratio, that whole, and, and those whole small number are different. And H2O is 2 to 1, while in H2O2 is 1 to 1. So that's basically the law of multiple proportion. Now, the atom has a few, uh, three important sub sub subatomic particles. In Dalton's view, the atom was the smallest particle possible. Many discoveries led to the fact that the atom itself was made up of smaller particles. Okay, so you can see that in section two point two, okay, where you can find. B electrons and cathode rays, also their activity, um, the nucleus, protons, and, the, and, and neutrons. And also, I put in, in D2L a link where you can find in the folder of chapter 2 uh, a very interesting video of how protons, electrons, and neutrons were discovered. Okay, so you can you need to look that video because maybe one question was going to come from those experiments. So you may um, take a few minutes to see that video. So let's talk about the subatomic particles. Protons, they have a charge of plus one, and electrons of minus one, and the neutrons that are neutral. So those are the three most important subatomic particles. The protons, the electrons, and the neutral. The protons have a charge of plus one, electrons have a charge of minus one, and the neutron, neutrons are neutral. Protons and neutrons have essentially the same mass, the relative mass one while the mass of an electron is so small that we ignore it. We basically said that it's zero. Okay, its relative mass is zero com as compared to the protons and the neutrons. Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus. The electrons travel around the nucleus. Okay, so basically, if we can, once we have this uh, mental picture, we have a nucleus, and inside those nucleus, we have the protons and the neutrons, and all around that nucleus, we're going to find the electrons travel around that nucleus. Here we have a table of, for some um, characteristic protons positive one, neutrons neg neutral, and electron negative one. And we can see here the mass of each of, of, of each particle, subatomic particle. And we can see that protons and neutrons basically are the same, while the electron is really, really, really small, okay, as compared with the protons and neutrons. So that's why. It seems, or you can say that basically is zero, is negligent. So the atomic mass. The atoms have extremely small masses. And as you may, uh, uh, as you may think, that mass is going to depend on the number of neutrons and protons. Okay? So the heaviest known atom have a mass of approximately four a power of 10 of minus 2 grams. So it has a really, really small mass. A mass scale on the atomic level is used where an atomic mass unit is the base unit. So the atomic mass unit, the 1 AMU, is equal to 1.660054 times power of minus 24 grams. So basically, this is a conversion factor, okay, of the mass, atomic mass, as, and, and we um, consolidate or define that as one AMU. This is basically the atomic mass unit. The atomic and molecular weight can be measured with great accuracy using a mass spectrometer. 
and the mass that we usually compare uh, all the elements is the mass of carbon atom that has six protons and six neutron and established that is carbon 12. Here we have basically an example of a, spectro a mass spectrometer. Okay, so how, um, and some of the sample that go through here and then it can be detected and we can be separate. This is basically a chlorine. You are a sample of chlorine. Chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 can be separated in that detector. So it's very, very, um, has a very high accuracy, the mass spec to determine the atomic mass of elements. Now let's talk about the symbols of elements. Here we have carbon, a 12 and a 6. The C is the symbol of an element, okay, in this case of carbon. Number 6 represents the atomic number. The atomic number also is the number of protons or electrons. Okay, the atomic number is represent the number of protons or electrons for the element. And in blue, okay, here we have 12. This is the mass number. The mass number is the number of protons plus neutrons. So here we have the mass number and the atomic number and the symbol of the um, element. Elements are represented by one or two letter symbol. This is the symbol for, for carbon as I mentioned. Also, if we have uh, two, the, the symbol has two letters, the first one is gonna be capital while the other one is gonna be a low, small, uh, a low letter, okay? All atoms of the same element have the same number of protons, which is called the atomic number. And the atomic number is also the number that is represented in the period table. We're gonna see that in a few more slides. Okay, so it's going to be organized by, by that atomic number. And that atomic number is represented also as a Z, and it is written as a subscript before the symbol. So most of the time it's going to be here, the Z, that represents the atomic number, also the number of protons. The mass number is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of an atom. It is written as a superscript before the symbol. So here we're going to add, uh, always going to put here, right here, the mass number, and down here we're going to write the atomic number, okay, the atomic number representing the protons, and the mass number representing the number of protons and neutrons. And this, the uh, element here represented by one or two letter symbol. If it's one, it's going to be always capital, and if it's two, the first one is going to be capital letter, the second one is going to be lower a letter. Now let's talk a little bit about the isotopes. The isotopes are atoms of the same element with different masses. Isotopes have different number of neutrons, but the same number of protons. They need to be the same number of protons because the protons is the characteristic of the element. So if we are talking about that they are of the same element, that means that the number of protons can't change. So if there's something different, it's not going to be in, in, the, in the mass number, it's not going to be the number of protons. It's going to be the number of neutrons. So for example, carbon has four isotopes, carbon 11, carbon 12, 13, and 14. The atomic uh, or the number of protons or atomic number for, for carbon is six. So the atomic number for all of this is going to be six because it's carbon. The number of electrons also is going to be six because we have the same number of protons and electrons. This is neutral, so they can cancel between them. Six positive charge and six negative charge is equal to zero. So that's why you have the same number of uh, protons and electrons because we're talking about an element that has a uh, neutral uh, charge, zero charge. But we have that the number of neutrons is going to be different in each of the isotopes. Here we're going to have 5, 6, 7, and 8 because the mass number here is 11. And if protons is 6, that means that 11 minus 6 is equal to 5. That's the number of protons. Remember that this number is the sum of protons plus neutrons. So we know the number of neutrons. So 12 minus 6 is equal to 6. That's the number of neutrons in carbon 12. In carbon 13, we have that the number of protons is going to be 6 because we're talking about carbon. So 13 minus 6 is going to be 7. And this is the number of neutrons. The same thing with carbon 14. Carbon 14, 14 minus 6 
is going to give us the number of neutrons that is eight. Okay, so that's how we can determine the number of neutrons. And now we understand that the number of the, the different isotopes, the difference is going to be in the number of neutrons. The number of protons needs to be the same because we're talking about atoms, different atoms of the same element, okay, with different masses. Now, the atomic weight. Because in the real world, we use large amounts of atoms and molecules, we use an average masses in calculation. An average mass is found using all isotopes of an element weighted by their relative abundance. This is the element's atomic weight. In other word, words, the atomic weight is going to be equal to the sum of the isotope mass times the fractional natural abundance. And this is going to be um, it's going to be the sum of all the different isotopes. So, for example, for, for carbon, we have four isotopes. So we're going to look for the isotope mass of all of four carbons and the fractional uh, the abundance of each of them. And we're going to sum all of them to give us the uh, atomic weight. So let's see an example of this to clarify a little bit more this concept. The atomic weight, the natural occurring chlorine is 75.78 for the isotope chlorine 35. And the atomic mass for this isotope is 34.969. And 24.22% of chlorine 37. So here we have that the chlorine um, um, element has two isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So we can calculate the atomic weight by multiplying the abundance of each isotope by its atomic mass and then summon these products. But first, we need to change those percent to decimal. So we divide uh, the, the percent by 100, and 75.78 is going to be equal to 0 0.7578, while the 24.22 divided by 100 is going to be equal to 0 0.2422. And now this abundance will multiply by the respective atomic mass. So this one is going to be multiplied by this and the 0.2422 by the atomic mass of um, chlorine 37 and that way you see here we have the abundance and decimal expressed in decimal we have the atomic mass of that isotope 35 and then we have the abundance of the uh, second isotope 37 we multiply each of them is going to be 26.50 atomic mass unit plus the product of this multiplication is 8.953 now remember that here we have five significant figures, four significant figures, so this is going to be represented in four. As well here we have four and here five, so we represent this in four significant figures. Okay, we need to follow the rules that we mentioned in chapter one. And now we need to add, so our, our um, answer needs to be with two decimal position because we now look for the decimal uh position that we have here. We have two, we have three, so our result must be 35.45 atomic mass unit. This is basically the atomic weight for chlorine. It's due to the presence of the two different isotopes. This answer makes sense. The atomic weight, which is actually the average atomic mass, is between the masses of the two isotopes and is closer to the value of chlorine 35. Why do you think it's closer to chlorine 35? because that isotope has the highest uh, abundance than the other one. So the average is going to be closer than to the 35 than the, the, for the 37. And this is how you calculate the atomic weight okay, of an element by using the isotopic abundance. Let's talk now about the periodic table. The periodic table is a systematic organization of elements. The elements, as I mentioned before, are arranged in order of atomic number. Here we have uh, the element of hydrogen, the symbol H, and the atomic number is on top of the symbol. We have here the silver. Silver is Ag, and the atomic number is on top of the Ag. Remember that the atomic number also represents the number of protons and electrons. 
Okay, so it, it, silver has 47 protons and 47 electrons as an element. And also, as you can see, all the elements that has a symbol of two letters, the first one is capital and the second one is a lower letter. So the atomic weight of an element appears most of the time at the bottom of the box, but here we just are showing just the atomic number and also the symbol. But in other ones, you're going to see also the um, atomic weight most of the time in the bottom of, this, of the, of the box, box of each element. Now, the rows on the periodic table are called periods. So we have period one here. It's composed of hydrogen and helium. Period two, period three goes from here, magnesium to aluminum, silicon, and all the way to the right. And then we have period four from potassium to krypton, um, uh, period five from rubidium to selenium, and so on until period number seven. So from left to right, you can find the periods. And the columns are called the groups, okay? Group 1A, group 2A, group 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. This group, the B group, are known as the transition metals, okay? So this, these are different as this one, but they need to be here because they, uh, we can see, a, we're, gonna, we're gonna see a little bit later, they have um, this periodic, periodicity of uh, characteristic. So that's why this is order is rearranged in this kind of table. But that's why you can see here that's go from 1A to 2A and then jump to 3A here. Okay, so this one are transitional elements or transitional atoms. Also, elements in the same group have similar chemical properties. So all of these elements, they are in the same family or the same group. They are some, sometimes they're also called family, family or group 1A they have similar chemical properties. Potassium and calcium, they have different chemical properties. But calcium and barium, for example, they have similar chemical properties because they, ha they, they are in the same group or same family. The periodic table is called periodic because of the periodicity, as I mentioned before. When one looks at the chemical properties of elements, one notice a repeating pattern of reactivity. And First of all, uh, they, they, they put the elements in like an order and line like this, but they, 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 they observe this uh, uh, characteristic that in the 2, the 10, and the 18, they basically were non-reactive gas. This one, the green ones, were like soft reactive metals. And, and that, that way, they start to look for those characteristics that they, they were repeat, uh, they, they repeat uh, in, in certain times. In a certain position and that's how they come out with this table okay so that's why they all of this as I mentioned have the same characteristic chemical characteristic and as this one group 5 all of this have basically the same chemical properties 7 7a, 7a also okay so that's why they are ordered or rearranged arranged in this type of table now the groups also they have some of them has name Group 1A, that's all known as the alkaline metals. Group 2A, the alkaline earth metal. Group 6A is known as the chalcogens. The group 7A, halogens. And the 8A is the noble gases. Okay, they're, they're really rare gases. These five groups are known by their name, the ones that we mentioned before. So these are basically the names of group 1, 2, 6, 7, and 8A. Now, another really important uh, information that we can obtain from the periodic table is that at the left side of the periodic table, we're going to find all those elements that are considered metals at the left side. Basically, all of these uh, yellowish or beige uh, boxes, all of these are metal. Hydrogen is an exception. It's at the left side of the periodic table, but it's not considered a metal. Some properties of metal include shiny lusters, conducting heat and electricity, and solidity, except mercury. All of them basically are solid with the exception of mercury. Now let's talk about the nonmetals. 
we can find the nonmetals at the right side of the periodic table. All these um, elements in green and also hydrogen, they are considered the nonmetals. Even though the hydrogen is in the left side of the periodic table, is an exception and is part of the nonmetal group. So all of this yellowish or beige, they are metal, while the green ones are considered nonmetals. The nonmetals, they can be solid, like carbon, they can be liquid like bromine, or they can be gas as neon at room temperature. So basically these are the nonmetals. The third group that we can find or identify in the periodic table is the metalloids. These are the ones that are part of this kind of step-like line here, okay? These six elements are known as the metalloids. Their properties are sometimes like metals and sometimes like nonmetal. Okay, so we're going to have, we can identify it in the periodic table, the metals, the nonmetals, and also the metalloids, um, and, and also the characteristics. Let's talk now about chemical formulas. Now that we have been talking about elements, what can we do with the elements where well, we can combine them and create chemical formulas? The subscript to the right of the symbol of an element tells us the number of atoms of that element in one molecule of the compound. So for example, here we have H2. So that means that in a molecule of hydrogen, we have two atoms of hydrogen. Oxygen, O2. In a molecule of oxygen, we're gonna find two atoms of oxygen. H2, water. So we're gonna find in, in each molecule of water, two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. In ethylene, for example, we have C2H4. That means that in each of these molecules, you're gonna have two atoms of carbon and four atoms of hydrogen. The molecular compounds are composed of molecules and almost always contain only nonmetals. So when we combine nonmetals, we're talking about molecular compounds. And remember that you can find those nonmetal at the right side of the periodic table. Also, there is a group of diatomic molecules that you can find them as in, in, in occur naturally, okay? So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, you, they are molecules and you can find them as H2, N2, O2, F2, Cl2, Br2, and I2. So these are basically molecules that, that exist as diatomic because you're gonna they're going to have two atoms of each in each molecule of the, um, of the, the, the here in the list. Also, we have different kinds of formula. The first one we're going to define is the empirical formulas. These formulas give the lowest whole number ratio of atoms of each element in a compound. We have also the molecular formulas. Because this one gives the exact number of atoms of each element in a compound. So if we know the molecular formula of a compound, we can determine its empirical formula. But if we have the empirical formula, we can't know which one was the molecular formula, okay? So from the molecular formula, we can determine a specific empirical formula. But from the empirical formula, we can because we're gonna have a lot of options that can come from just one empirical formula. There's gonna to be tons of molecules that, can, that, could, that, that you can create, okay? So you can go from molecular to empirical, but not to empirical to molecular so far, okay? So let's write the empirical formula for glucose, okay? Uh, a substance also known as either blood sugar or dextrose. The molecular formula is 6 cis, 6, C6H12O6. And also we're gonna do the same with nitrous oxide, uh, a substance used in anesthetic and I'll commonly uh, called the laughing gas and the molecular formula as N2O. So this is the molecular formula of glucose, okay? And we need to determine, we need to determine the um, empirical formula. To determine the empirical formula, we need to look for the largest common factor 
of each of the numbers that we, that, that we find, that we can find in the molecular formula. So we have here the 6, we have the 2, we have the 1. One possible uh, common factor is going to be the 2. But also we can use, we can have the 3, and also we can have the 6. So those are three uh, common factors, but we're going to use the largest common factor. And we're going to divide all those numbers by that largest common factor. So uh, we can see that the largest common factor is going to be 6. So 6 divided by 6 is going to be 1. 12 divided by 6 is 2. 6 by 1 is going to be 1. So that means that our empirical formula is going to be CH2O. This is the empirical formula for glucose. We just divide it by the largest common factor of the three, in this case, uh, subscript that we have in glucose, that is six. So six divided by six, one. And most of the time, we're not going to write one because just the presence of the symbol of the element means one. Okay, so we're not going to see C1H2ZO1. Okay, so we have the C, just one C is going to represent one. And 12 divided by six is going to be two. And 6 divided by 6 is going to be 1. Okay, so this is the empirical formula for glucose. Now, what about the nitrous oxide, N2O, which will be a com the largest common factor between this, the 2 and the 1? It's going to be the 1, okay, because um, that's basically the, the, the lowest integral number that we can find. So in this case, the empirical formula is going to be equal to the molecular formula. Sometimes we can find that, as we saw here, okay? So we can determine sometimes, uh, um, we can determine basically the empirical formula by dividing, uh, using the largest common factor, okay? Or sometimes that molecular formula is also the empirical formula because we don't have a uh, largest common factor uh, as different as one, okay? So let's do another one example, another example. This is the molecular formula for decaborane. So it's B10H14. What will be the empirical formula for this? The largest common factor will be 2. Okay, so we divide 10 by 2 is 5. 14 divided by 2 is going to be 7. So it will be B5H7. That will be basically the empirical formula for decaborane. We also have different ways in which we can represent the molecules. One is the structural formula. The structural formula shows the order in which atoms are attached. They do not depict the three-dimensional shape of molecules. So in the structural formulas, the only thing that we know is how they are attached between them. We have one hydrogen, one carbon, and one hydrogen. One hydrogen, one carbon, one hydrogen. So we see that one carbon is attached to four hydrogen as well here. One carbon, four hydrogens. Okay. Now we also have the perspective drawings. The perspective drawings also show the three-dimensional order of the atoms in a compound. These are also demonstrated using the models that we're going to use in the lab. So these three representations are the perspective. Uh, in this case, the wedge basically uh, is out of the page, so it's in front of you. The dash uh, dash wedge is in the back side of the screen, okay? And the solid line basically are in the plane of the screen. Okay, so that's why this representation is different from this. This has some perspective because this one is in front hydrogen and this hydrogen is in the back part while this hydrogen, uh, hydrogens are in the plane of the screen. Also this one, the balls and stick model, basically is the same as this one, it's the same perspective. We have this hydrogen and this hydrogen in the plane, okay? This one is in front of you, and this one is backward of the plane of the plane of the screen. And this other one is a space filling model. And here, the difference between this and this is that we can see here the bond between the hydrogen and the carbon. Here is basically um, uh, occupy the, all the, the, the the filling model occupy that bond, okay, and create that sense of area where those electrons are found. So these are the different ways that we can draw or represent molecules, okay, the structural formulas that just tell us uh, the order 
and the perspective drawing that gave us a three-dimensional perspective of the molecules. Let's talk now about ions. When an atom of a group of atoms loses or gain electrons, it becomes an ion. Okay, so remember this. Let's let's uh, review what we have learned so far about the electrons, neutrons, and protons. The number of protons. If we change the number of protons, we're going to have different elements because the atomic number or number of protons represent the atomic number that is characteristic of each element. So hydrogen always going to be one, helium two. So if you have different number of protons, you're talking about different elements. If you have different number of neutrons, you're going to have different isotopes of the same element. Okay, if you have different number of neutrons, you're going to have isotope of the same element. Now, if you have, if, if you change the number of electrons, if you add or remove electrons, now you're going to have ions. You, you haven't changed the number of protons, so that means that you're going to have at the same element with a charge. If you gain electron, it's going to be a negative charge. If you lose electron, it's going to be a positive because the element is neutral. We saw before, for example, carbon that has six electrons and six protons. If you remove one electron, it's going to be positive one because before it was zero. But because you remove a negative, now you have a positive. On the other hand, if you, for somehow, you add one electron, now you're going to have seven electrons. So you're going to have one more electron that protons, so now that carbon will be negative. Okay, so in the end, you have created an electron. So that's how you create electrons. When you lose or gain, I mean, that's how you create ions, sorry. When you lose or gain electrons. Cations are formed when at least one electron is lost. Monatomic cations are formed by metals. So when you lose electrons, at least one, you are forming an ion that is a, has a positive charge and it's known as cations. And all the metals produce cations. Okay, the cations are going to be formed by metals. In other hands, if you gain electrons, now you're going to create an anion. An ion with a negative charge. And most of the time, when you have monatomic anions, they are going to be formed by the nonmetals. So the nonmetals that are the ones that we can find on the right side of the uh, uh, periodic table, they're going uh, they're going to produce the anions. While the metals on the left side are the ones that are going to produce the cations as well as hydrogen. You see why hydrogen needs to be here because in this case hydrogen gain one electron. Okay, I mean lose an electron and this positive, so it's similar to the group one A. Okay, so that's why hydrogen also is part of the 1A. Now, let's write uh, some chemical symbols for ions. Give the chemical symbol, including a superscript, indicating the mass number for the ion with 22 protons, 26 neutrons, and 19 electrons. And also the ion sol and we're going to also create the other uh, chemical symbol for the ion sulfur that has sulfur that has 16 neutrons and 18 electrons. Let's work with A first, okay? So the atomic number is equal to the number of protons. We have 22 protons. So if we go now to the periodic table and look for number 22, we're going to find the titanium, okay? And now um, that we have uh, the symbol of titanium, we can look for the charge of that um, ion. We're going to look for the number of protons that is going to be 22 minus the number of electrons that is going to be 19. 22 minus, minus 19 is going to be equal to plus 3. Okay, so the charge of our, 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 of our ion, ion is plus 3, and it's like a cation. Okay, it's like a cation because it's a positive charge. Also, titanium is a metal. Okay, so when you have a metal and you need to create an ion, always is going to be a cation. It could be plus one, plus two, plus three. It could be 
have different charges, but he for sure is going to be a cation. And the third thing that we need to calculate is the mass number. The mass number is equal to the number of neutrons plus protons. Okay, so the mass number is number of protons plus neutron. Protons is 22, neutrons 26. So we have a, a mass number of, of 48. So that means that our chemical symbols for this um, ion is titanium, mass number of 48 on the top side, on the left side, and the positive 3. Okay, it's a cation with a charge of plus 3 and the mass number of 48. Now the second example is going to be, not, we know that uh, is, is sulfur, the ion is sulfur. It has 16 neutrons and 18 electrons. So how can we know the number of protons? Because we know that it's sulfur, and we, if we want to go to the periodic table, we can find that sulfur is number 16. So it has 16 protons. Okay, Sulfur is 16 in the periodic table. So that's why we can find from the atomic number the number of protons. Now, the charge will be basically the number of protons minus the electrons. So we have 16 electrons from here, okay? And we have 18 electrons that are in the, in the problem. So it's going to be 16 minus 18 is going to be equal to minus 2. So that means that the charge for this ion is going to be minus 2. So we are creating an anion, okay? And remember that sulfur is part of the nonmetals, and the nonmetals will produce ions with negative charge or anions. Okay, so we are basically in the right track. Also, we need to determine the um, mass number. So we're going to sum the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Once again, 16 from sulfur, okay, the atomic number, so 16, plus the number of neutrons that are 16 also. So that means that is going to be 32. And the uh, symbol for this ion is going to be a sulfur and the 32 as a mass number and the charge of minus or 2 minus. Okay, so we have here an example of an anion and here an example of a cation. In general, we'll focus on the net charges of ions and ignore their mass number unless the circumstances dictate that we specif specify a certain isotope. For most of the time, we're going to see just S2 minus or Ti3 plus. Okay. Another exercise that we can do is in which of the following species is the number of protons less than the number of electrons? You're going to have less number of protons than electrons, so you're going to have more electrons. So that means that you're going to have, first of all, an ion. When you have a neutral element with no charge, it's not an ion because an ion has a charge. It could be positive or negative. And it's going to be positive or negative depending if it gain or lose electrons. In this one, we, it's mentioned that basically we gain electrons because you have lower number of protons than electrons. So you have a number, a higher number of electrons. Which of those five represent this species? It could be B. Okay, phosphorus 3 minus, and also D, selenium minus 2. Okay, those are the ones that represent um, species that has a lower number of protons than the electrons. Here, these are some uh, a table with some uh, common cations. These are cations with a charge of plus one, most of them are from family one, okay? And also here are charge of two plus, most of them are family two, and these are three plus, aluminum is part of, of, of group uh, plus three. Now also, NH4 is the only polyatomic cation, is the only cation with more than one um, element, NH4. We have nitrogen and hydrogen. So ammonium ion is a cation, the only polyatomic cation that is known. Also, uh, we can see here that we have copper with a charge of plus one, but also copper with a charge of plus two. 
as well, iron has a charge of plus two, but also iron can, ha can have a, a charge of plus three. Okay, so we have elements. Most of them are going to be in, you're going to find them in the transition elements. Remember that, that, that block, the B block in the periodic table, some of those um, elements, when they are formed cations, you, you're going to have cation with more than one um, charge. Okay, so here, uh, uh, copper, for example, you can find copper as plus, plus one or plus two. And you will identify it, and the name will be copper one or cuprous ion or copper two or cupric ion. The same thing with the iron. Iron is iron two will be ferrous ion or iron three will be ferric ion. So if you have an, an, an element with two different uh, charges, okay, positive charge, the one with the lower charge is gonna have the ending of OUS while the one with the a higher charge is gonna have the uh, ending of IC, okay? So that's why copper cuprous here or copper cupric here. So cupric is plus two, cupros is uh, uh, one, okay? Cupros, copper one, cupric, copper two. Also, we have here the common, the table of the common anions. Um, the charge of minus one, most of them are from family or group seven, okay, because those are the ones that has charge of minus one. And also we have other kinds of anions with charge of two minus or three minus, as well as polyatomic anions. And in the anions is more common to see polyatomic anions, okay? So here we have acetate, chlorate, perchlorate, permanganate, chromate, dichromate, uh, phosphate ions, okay? So basically, this is a, a, a table with the most common anions. And as you can see here, those anions basically are obtained from the nonmetals. Okay, the nonmetals. We mentioned before that molecular compounds are uh, produced by the combination of nonmetals. Now, the ionic compound, okay, are generally formed by the combination of a metal and a nonmetal. Okay, one example is sodium chloride. Sodium is from family one, while chlorine is from family seven. Okay, so family seven is part of the nonmetal, while the family one is part of the metal. So this is a combination of a metal and a nonmetal, so it's classified as an ionic compound. Electrons are transferred from the metal to the nonmetal. Because remember that the metals, if they're going to produce an, an, an ion, is going to be a cation. And the only way that you can produce a cation is by releasing electrons. Okay, so all the metals always are going to release electrons, while the nonmetals are going to receive those electrons. That's why the nonmetal, when they produce an, an, an ion, they're going to be anions, ions with negative charges. Okay? So the oppositely charged ions attract each other. All the empirical formulas are written. Okay, so here we have, for example, the uh, sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons. This is sodium is a metal, is gonna lose an electron, so it's gonna produce a positive charge in this element. So now it is an anion, as a cation. And that electron is gonna be received, okay, by the atom of chlorine. And it's gonna produce the ion chlorine here with the negative charge of minus one. So this is plus one and this is minus one. So you combine one and one. That's why sodium chloride is, is an ACL because positive one and negative one, you just need one of each to cancel them, okay? Now, how we can write ionic formulas or uh, formulas or chemical formulas from ionic compounds? Because compounds are electrically, electri electrically neutral, one can determine the formula of a compound by this way. The charge on the cation becomes the subscript on the anion, while the charge on the anion becomes the subscript of the cation. If the subscripts are not in the lowest whole number ratio, divide them by the greatest common factor. So here we have 
magnesium plus two and nitrogen three minus. So when we combine these two, the only thing that we're gonna do is switch those, the charge, and we're gonna put uh, as a subscript of the other one. So magnesium now is gonna be three and nitrogen is gonna have the two. Okay, so it makes sense because if we have three magnesium, each magnesium has a charge of two plus. So three times two plus is gonna be six plus. While nitrogen, you're gonna have two nitrogens in this molecule, and each nitrogen is a minus three, so two times minus three is gonna be minus six. So that means that we're gonna have a minus six for nitrogen, a plus, plus six from magnesium, so we can cancel and our compound is neutral, okay, because all the compounds needs to be neutral. And that how, how you can cancel those charges, okay? So you're gonna have three of magnesium and two of nitrogen. Three of magnesium, two of nitrogen, is gonna be here a plus six because it's three times the charge of magnesium, that is two plus, so you're gonna have a six plus. While in nitrogen, you're gonna have two nitrogens. Each of them is three minus, so you have two, so it's gonna be a total of six minus. Six minus plus six plus is gonna be zero. Now let's talk about the nomenclature of the inorganic compounds. There are some rules. The first one is that we need to write the name of the cation. If the cation can have more than one possible charge, write the charge as a Roman numer numeral in parentheses, as we saw before, for example, with uh, copper, copper one or copper two, okay? So if we're gonna use, uh, for somehow, we have the copper two is gonna be copper and, and the Roman number two, okay? If the anion is an element, change its ending to IDE. If the anion is a polyatomic ion, simply write the name of the polyatomic ion. So let's see some examples. Here we have uh, K2SO4, BaOH, parenthesis, uh, the OH is in parenthesis too, and FeCl3. This is potassium. This is a polyatomic anion, is sulfate. We have barium and OH is hydroxide. We have iron and we have here chlorine, okay? So, in the first one, we have potassium and this is sulfate, so it's gonna be potassium sulfate. That's the name of this compound. This is barium, this is hydroxide, the, so the name of this one is barium hydroxide. And this is iron and this is chlorine. Now, this iron could be plus two or plus three. In this case, what is the charge of this iron, of this anion, I mean cation? How many chlorine we have? Three. And the charge of chlorine is minus one because it's from family seven. And all the anions from family seven that are produced are gonna be minus one. So if we have three minus one, that means that it's a three minus, that iron must be a three plus. So the iron is gonna be iron three. Okay, so that means that the cation is, the, for, for the first one, the cation is potassium, the anion is sulfate. So we're gonna have potassium sulfate as, as the name of that compound. The second one, barium hydroxide, and the name is barium hydroxide. And the third one, iron, as I mentioned, is three. So it's gonna be iron three chloride or ferric chloride. Remember that also we're gonna to need to add the IDE at the end of the um, anion. So we have iron three chloride or ferric chloride. Both are basically correct. Now also let me uh, mention something important here. We have the OH. If we need to combine barium with OH, OH has a charge of minus one while barium have a charge of plus two. So to cancel the charges, we need two of hydroxide. That's why we need to put the hydroxide in parenthesis and put the two outside as a subscript. Because if we don't use the parenthesis, it means that we have BaOH2, and that's not barium hydroxide. Okay, so we need to use the parenthesis whenever 
we need more than one polyatomic ion. And in this case, we need two polyatomic ions of hydroxide to cancel the plus two of the barium. So that's why you need to put the, the polyatomic ion in parentheses and then as a subscript, we need to add the number of how many do you need. And in this case, we need two hydroxide because barium is two plus and each hydroxide is one minus. Now let's talk about another kind of ion. It's called the oxyanion. Okay, and I'll also talk about the nomenclature of this ion. When there are there are two oxyanions involving in the same elements, the one with the fewer oxygens ends in with ITE, while the one with the more oxygens has the ending of ATE. Okay, so for example, we have the NO2 and NO3. So the oxyanions are basically when you have more than one oxygen and the combination of different polyatomic ions. So we have two here and three here. The one with the fewer oxygen is nitrate, and with the highest number of oxygen is nitrate. Okay, the same thing here with sulfite and sulfate. Okay, so we have sulfite with three oxygen, sulfate with four oxygen. The one with the fewer oxygens and with ITE, the one with the uh, more no larger number of oxygen, it will have the end of ATE sulfate. Also, uh, if we look for a perspective of the periodic table, the elements are from per period number two that can create oxyanion ions, uh, the maximum number is going to be three oxygen. Okay, so we're going to have a maximum number of oxygen of three if we combine with any element from of the element for period two. And from period three, the number maximum number is four oxygen. Okay, so we can have PO4 or PO3 also is another kind of ion. CO3 or CO2 or CO. Okay, so but you, you're not gonna find never CO4, neither NO4. Okay, because the maximum number of oxygen that you can combine with um, an element from period two is gonna be three. As well as period three, there's gonna be four. So you're never gonna see PO5 for example, okay? So the central atom on the second row have a bond to at most three oxygen. Those on the third row take up four, okay? So the central atom here, the maximum number is gonna be three. The maximum number of oxygen that could be um, bond with the central atom is gonna be four. And also the charge of the central atom will increase as you go from right to left. So the charge is increasing for the um, as you go from right to left. Okay, it's minus one, minus two, minus three. The charge of the polyatomic ion is going to increase from left, right to left. Also, let's talk a little bit about the acids and the nomenclature of acids. So for if when we have the anion, for example, chloride or chlorate or perchlorate or chloride or hypochlorite, we just need to add hydrogens, okay? So we're going to have HCl or HCl3, HClO2, and we're going to produce a, an acid. And usually the nomenclature to start with the name hydro when we have the HCl, hydrochloric acid, or chloric acid, perchloric acid, chlorous acid or hypochlorous acid. So when you have an ATE as the ending of the anion, you're going to use the IC as the ending of the acid. So chlorate turns to chloric, perchlorate turns to perchloric. And always we're going to finish with the word acid. The same thing with the ITE. But the ITE will turn to OUS or chloride or hypochlorite to chlorous or hypochlorous acid. So if the anion in the acid ends in IDE, change the ending to IC acid and add the prefix hydro. So hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid. So in this case, IDE chloride, we're gonna use the IC ending, okay? So that's why we use the, uh, uh, it's, 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 we call the HCl hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, 
and hydroionic acid. So if we have an ion that uh, ends with ITE, then we're going to change the ending to use OUS acid. So hypochlorous acid, because this came from hypochlorite, from chloride, okay, that is this one, and hypochlorite. And chlorus came from, from chloride, okay, so that's why we're ending the OUS acid when, we, when the anion is the ITE. And finally, if the anion ends with ATE as chloride or perchlorate, the acid, now we're going to turn with using the IC at the end and the word acid. So it's going to turn from chlorate to chloric acid, from perchlorate to perchloric acid. Also, we're going to here learn how to um, do the nomenclature of binary molecular compounds. The name of the element farther to the left in the periodic table or lower in the same group is usually written first. Okay, remember that when we are talking here about a combination of two non-metal. In the ionic compound, the metals is going to be always the ion from the metal. The cation is going to be always the first one. Okay, and you're going to uh, mention that first. And then the anion, okay, sodium chloride. Sodium is a cation, chloride is an anion. So always going to be cation and then anion. In the molecular compounds that are the combination of two nonmetals, they are nonmetal, you're going to name or first, okay, the one that are more to the left or lower in the same group, okay, is the one that you're going to write first. A prefix is used to denote the number of atoms of each element in the compound. So, in, in the ionic compounds, we never use prefixes, but in the molecular compound, we need to use prefixes. Okay, and that's why we have here the table of prefixes. Mono, 1, D, 2, Tri, 3, Tetra, 4, Penta, 5, Exa, 6, and so on. Okay, mono is not used on the first element listed, however. Okay, so you're not going to use mono in the first. If you just have one atom, okay, in the of the first element that you're going to write, you're not going to use the mono, okay, for that one. So the ending on the second element is changed to IDE. So, for example, carbon, CO2, carbon, two oxygen, dye, and oxygen, we're going to turn the oxygen to oxide because we're going to use the IDE. So carbon dioxide. This one, CCL4, carbon, and remember, because it's just one, so because it's the first one, we're not going to use the word mono here. Okay? But we have four chlorines. So it's tetra, tetra chloride. This is chlorine, okay? But we're going to use the IDE, okay, because it's now... Uh, uh, this is part of the nomenclature for the binary compounds. If the prefix ends with A or O and the name of the element begins with a vowel, the two successive vowels are often elided into one. Okay, so for example, here we have dinitrogen pentaoxide. So we just use pentoxide, okay, the nitrogen pentoxide instead of pentaoxide. So let's do some examples. SO2, PCO5, Cl2O3. So SO2 is sulfur, okay, sulfur, and we're going to use the word mono, so it's sulfur, and from here we have two oxygen, and we have two, so it's dioxide, okay, so we have the first one is going to be sulfur dioxide. PCL4, PCL5, sorry, P is for phosphorus, we have five, so it's penta, chloride phosphor phosphorus pentachloride and the last one we have two chlorine and we have three oxygen so it's dichlorine trioxide okay dichlorine trioxide because here we have two chlorine and we use the ine uh, end okay because it's not the last one and the last one is the one we change from uh, ine to ide so here we have dichlorine trioxide.
let's try also this one, CS2. This will be carbon disulfide. Okay, carbon disulfide. Car carbon monoxide. Here we're going to use the word mono for this one. Okay, and so on and so on. And also we can do go from the name, okay, silicon tetrabromide. So this is going to be SI and tetrabromide. Tetra is from fluor, bromide BR, SI BR4. Okay, so you can practice also with from going from the uh, name to the uh, molecular formula or the chemical formula. Now, finally, we're going to talk about nomenclature, nomenclature of organic compounds. Organic chemistry is the study of carbon. So organic chemistry is related with all the compounds that has carbon. Organic chemistry has its own system of nomenclature. The simplest hydrocarbon are alkanes, compounds containing only carbon and hydrogens. Okay, These are examples of those alkanes. The first part of the name just listed correspond to the number of carbon. Meth is from 1, so it's methane. ETH from 2, ethane. Propane, pure prop, is 3. Okay, So here we have... Uh, examples of the nomenclature of organic compound. This one is alkanes, just have carbon and hydrogen. Number four is butybutane for number four. When we have four carbons. So we have methane, ethane, and propane. Also, we have another groups, okay? When a hydrogen, for example, in an alkane is replaced by something else, the name is der derived from the name of the alkane. So here we're going to substitute one hydrogen for OH. This is a functional group. Okay, When you substitute a hydrogen for another uh, element or group of elements, those are known as functional groups. So here we have the OH, and the OH is the functional group for alcohols. Okay, So the end in the nose, the type of compounds. If we have talking about alcohol, now instead of methane, it's methanol. Instead of ethane, it's ethanol. Instead of propane, is propanol, okay? And we put a 1 here because the OH could be in the 1 or in the second carbon, okay? This is not the third one because if you put the OH here, you can start from here, the 1, okay? So you can have just two options. You could be here in 1 or 2. That's why we need to add the number 1 here to identify in the two possible positions that could be that OH where it is, okay? So it's going to be in 1 propanol. So these are basically the basic concepts of the nomenclature for organic compound. So this is basically a review for chapter two. We talk about the Dalton's theory, also the subatomic particles. Remember to look for the video in D2L of the different experiments to determine or how they uh, uh, discover okay, the, those the subatomic particles. We talk about the chemical symbols, the periodic table. We describe some information that we can obtain from the periodic table and also we talk about the type, types of formula we we'll work with some of them how to determine also the um, uh, isotopes okay and also the uh, molecular weight or atomic weight of the element and at the end we will talk a little bit about the nomenclature of inorganic compounds or ionic compounds uh, binary compounds or molecules and also organic compounds so this will be all for Chapter 2, Atoms, Molecules, and Ions.